Our next speaker doesn't need much of an introduction. I'm sure most of you know who he is. Eddie Pinar, he is the co-founder of Woo Themes, uh, quite a well-known gentleman. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, husband, and also a very new father. And I think you're also a new father. But yeah, that is true. That is uh, true. How do you think Eddie's been feeling lately? Oh, well, if he's anything like me, I'll tell you now. These pants, I've come to terms with it. These, these, are, the, these are them for, for, forever now. I think these are my dad pants. Really? What, yeah. Why? Why? Why well, are they dad pants? Well, when you, get a, when you have a child and you're wearing the pants when that happens, you just pretty much don't ever need to get another pair of pants. It's just how it works. Well, is that because the, the kid like pukes on them and like messes on them? Yeah, or are they just more comfortable? You, you come to terms with it. I was, I was, I, first night, I think it was, one of the early nights, had my little boy lying on my chest fast asleep, I had my shirt off and, and I just felt this little wow down into my armpit. And I remember I just I lay there and I just went <laughs> I think that was the defining moment when I became a dad. Just, just left it there. And then and then the next day it was great. I was eating uh, 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 Avalon toast, a piece of Avalon dropped into my shoe, I was like This thing just don't bother you anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So anyway, Eddie, uh, he's published this book called Rockstar Business, and he also has a couple of side projects that he runs, uh, such as the Rockstar Foundation. He also advises and mentors a lot of people as well. So, uh, WordCamp, I, I ask you to please put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, the probably very tired Eddie Pinar. First thing that you need to know about me is um, I'm going to be walking up and down the stage because I'm not tired. I don't know what Nick's talking about. And uh, Nick, tell you that, so what I did, I mean, these are recently washed, right? Yeah. I wish I knew that I could use this as some kind of container to prevent that from happening. So my biggest mistake was after feeding, like doing a little airplane with my son <laughs> and, and not having a buffer, which meant it went to my face. Oh. Anyway. So um, today I want to want to speak about something that is about WordPress and not about WordPress as well. And um, it's titled "Using WordPress to Build the MVP of Anything." So MVP, for those who know, minimum viable product. Um, it comes from like V methodology, so one of those high P words that's been going around in kind of startups and stuff. And um, I'm not big into high P words, and I don't find my subscribe to these kinds of things as if I can actually try it myself and like, learn about it and make my own mistakes. And that's kind of how I use WordPress in exactly this way. But because you start the presentation with a little joke first, I want to read you a little bit. So, so just before I read the joke, I, I, it might go over your heads. I'm not insulting you. So just, who doesn't know what MVP is, like the basic concepts? A uh, couple of hands, okay. So for those that do know, a product manager, so this is a developer joke, right? Or a techie joke. A product manager walks into the bar, only one stool, one bottle, because owner bought an minimum viable product. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so, speaking about kind of WordPress as, as an MVP, um, and using WordPress for MVP, what I realized was, so when I stepped away, you know, stepped away from the areas here to work on something new, I, um, I kind of realized that I had become more risk averse. And the interesting thing about that is, as like a, a first time founder, um, I mean, I was doing the math, 22 when I built the very first, first theme that eventually led to movement, to right? And back then, I was like, I was fucking help. Like I was fearless, I had no, I had no obligations, I didn't have a mortgage to pay, and I knew that if you know, things went to shit, I would literally just move back in with my parents, right? So it was like, it was a perfect life. And then you'd think that after six years of you know, helping build a company that's done really, really well, that I would have learned from those lessons, and like when you do it again the second time, like it's easier. And what I found immediately as I started on this new journey was, and it wasn't. Yes, I had all this experience, I had a bigger audience, all these good things, 
but it actually wasn't. And one of the big reasons it wasn't easier is because I actually became more risk averse. And that's one of the main reasons why I become more risk averse. I have a young family. And I knew that regardless of whose money I use to build this new thing that I want to build, execute on this idea, be really ambitious, that if I screwed things up, there would be implications for that. And would probably impact my family most. I couldn't move back in my parents' time. And beyond that, I previously burnt myself by doing stuff and not kind of focusing on MVP kind of approach or the kind of lean methodology of validating assumptions. And I actually lost a million rand pursuing something that I still don't know what the hell I was actually trying to build. It was literally it was a year of trying loads of different things and I lost a million bucks. So, in kind of speaking about assumptions, I see this is really small by the way, so I'll read for you. Any idea starts with two base or core you know, assumptions, and you can kind of extrapolate this into, doesn't matter how technical ideas, uh, technical or business model, horizontals, verticals, throw any single hyper in there, you'll find that every single business has these two things, which basically means I can build or produce something that someone else is willing to pay for, right? So, when you speak about MVP, it's about that kind of pixelating and validated learning. And the validated learning is specifically about how the hell can I do these two things that I assume I can do, right? So I can build or produce something that someone else can pay for. And the idea there is, and this is the methodology, is in terms of kind of the build, measure, and learn approach, where you're trying to close that cycle and do it as quickly as possible. So that yes, if you have to invest a thousand rand into building or you know, something, that you do a thousand rand, you don't spend a million rand doing something, right? So that you always kind of mitigate risk. Plus, you, fo you fo focus your attention on actually learning and building something that people will actually pay for. And that's basically if, kind of you know, the four things that I think works works well for when building you know, MVP. So, you're using it as a basis. You know, there's loads of stuff out there, and we'll get into that just now. So, it's minimal effort, firstly. You're identifying the, the customers, potential customers. You're building a following, building an audience to which you can sell. And then obviously, when you start interacting with those people, you start learning about the problem, right? So, it's like saying, you know what? Um, everybody needs another photo app on the iPhone, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, possible. But then you can, by actually engaging people, that you have this kind of brain, kind of groundbreaking idea of how your photo app can change the world. By putting that out there, and then by the way, getting the feedback, you might actually have a chance of building you know, successful business. <laughs> So I found this quote the other day, and it's from Dharmesh Shah, who's uh, one of the co-founders of HubSpot. Uh, it's talking about HubSpot and a like, private, you know, private company, and no idea of how big they are, but they're big, right? And this is what kind of Dharmesh says about WordPress specifically, and the, the, the great article is, is all about uh, writing code, writing code to validate ideas. And he says, to most of us, the WordPress brand connotes a free blog or a simple way to create a content website for non-technical folks. But the true magic of WordPress is the ability to extend its functionality, very important there, to create many kinds of web platforms while keeping your hands mostly code free. So if you think about that, and you kind of come up with a nice little kind of term, I didn't come up with this, and you look at kind of what would constitute, say for example, a, a blog first startup, right? And I have like three, you know, three quick examples for you. So Matamark is a new little startup out of uh, San Francisco. And it's literally started with um, Daniel Morrill, who was previously with Twitter. And she wrote analysis blog posts about startups. And people started following it. And she figured, well, people are liking this. And she put out a spreadsheet in you know, one of the articles. And people liked that and they consumed it. And through that, she literally built a company, and they now have a custom, a custom system to do all of this. 
But that system to get in now costs you 500 bucks a month. Groupon started not only as a blog, but as a WordPress blog. The very first versions of Groupon, I don't know for how long they exclusively used WordPress, but with WordPress blogs. And at the height of the kind of you know, flash sale thing, they were valued at five billion dollars. And it started with WordPress. Ghost. So when John Merlin had the idea for Ghost, he literally put a blog post together. And it's basically a static HTML page, one is only WordPress, and I think he stitched together like 11 or 12 images. So he didn't even do the effort of coding this up and marking it up in CSS and HTML, right? He put it out there and he got, the first day, 24 hours, got a quarter of a million unique visitors to the site. And that kind of interest sparked an eventual Kickstarter campaign and he's very well funded, I think, to do the converted. Paris conversion, we're talking about half a million rand or something like that. So, well, more, sorry, five million. Factor what's in there. So, this is significant kind of stuff. If you think about WordPress, for, you know, not first startups. And where I want to get to today, and this is where I will you know, make it personal again, how I've applied these things in my life and kind of my entrepreneurial journey in the last couple of months, is talking about what it means to have a WordPress first startup. And I know many of you can kind of think, well, fuck this, Eddie, how many blogs, you know, how many sites or businesses can we start with a blog? And I think there's something interesting there, right? That there's loads of different ways that you can use WordPress, pre-existing technology, and with little or no work, you can actually kickstart a business. And that's what I want to tell you about today. So one of the first ideas that I looked at to kick start my journey after with was, was this, all right? And you'll see the scrolls. Um, you'll see it's a very, very simple kind of brochure site. Right? And you'll see, I even A-B tested it with a slightly different idea, a slightly different engine, and the exact same thing. But that's what I want to get to. Because it wasn't about the idea, it wasn't about the site. I used WordPress, I used the existing theme, I jacked a little bit of things in there, changed the two lines of CSS, because that's what my skills allow. Five hours of work, I tested two ideas and I got 500 email addresses. And talking about email addresses, obviously that's very far from an actual something. But those were 500 email addresses, people, but I, people whose attention I got for five hours worth of work. Those 500 people, if I ever wanted to pursue those ideas, that's where I would start. I would literally just start speaking to them. So if we're talking about, as a very, very core level of building any business, and we're not talking about MVP as really as a product itself. Yeah. I'm talking about like those first steps that you want to take in building anything here is by getting a ability and learning it. And that's how I would do it. I had 500 people that indicated that they liked this idea. I was vague, I had not tested, you know, A-B tested the copy. I didn't even know exactly how to explain this thing. But I got 500 people's attention. I didn't do any marketing. I don't know how to use AdWords properly. I just waste money on that. I got 500 people's attention. WordPress allowed me to do that on five hours with work. Similarly, I could have gotten no email addresses. And what would I have lost? I would have lost five hours. <coughs> that was it. I didn't invest thousands of rands trying to build this idea in a vacuum and then put it out there and then start the value learning after I had gone through all that hard work, after I had taken on all, that, you know, all those risks in terms of building something that I just had assumptions about. So after this little experiment, I decided my heart wasn't in it. And what I actually wanted to work on was the thing I'm working on now, called Public Beta. And I just had this kind of, I had two things at that stage. I knew, wow, <laughs> those are the exact two same things. You think of revising these things. So 
That's supposed to be, I want to help entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs want help, right? So you should see how two different things then when I explain it. So I, I had this, right? So in terms of going back to kind of what my, those two core assumptions were that I assumed I could build something or produce something that would help other entrepreneurs. And I assumed that they wanted so much help that they would actually pay me for whatever I bought there. But you can understand how vague that proposition is. So this is what it is. So as with any good startup story these days, probably very sort with a landing page. And that was it. That's what it looked like, you know, that's not even the real copy, right? That's what it was. It was literally, and I didn't design the purpose, but that was a couple of hours work. Nothing fancy. And this wasn't WordPress yet, right? And the, so I, I'll tell you about the initial idea. So the initial idea was that I could produce educational content and people would pay me for it on a monthly basis. And I'd be in heaven because that'd be recurring revenue and I could just manage this shit to the top. So I got, I put this together, I explained that in a very vague way on the standing page. And within about eight weeks, this thing kind of took off and I, I got more than 2,000 in my business. And I, obviously I wrote about those, those strategies and I didn't want to, want to, you know, that, that's what this book's about, getting into that. And I knew that, okay, well, there's obviously something here. But I also knew that my assumptions were so vague that I needed to do something to actually validate this and make sure that what these 2,000 people are telling me, really telling me, and I'm hearing that thing. So they might be saying, hey, do you know what? I actually just suffer from FOMO, so I'm giving you my email address. So you can let me know when this thing launches, and then I'll check it out for real. Or what I want to hear is an entrepreneur, well, I have 2,000 paying customers willing to pay me tomorrow if I launch this thing. So there's a massive gap in that kind of my perception and the possible message. So I set about kind of building this thing, and I, and I knew beforehand that I couldn't produce all the content that I wanted to produce, purely because of the time commitment it would require, or cost commitment. So I needed to figure out the different way of doing it. So, I had a little site design and built by by you, organizer for the camp. See, I, I did that. And then, so I go into kind of what the site consisted of, right? And I'll give you a preview of what it looked like. And it had these kind of video courses on it. So, and the biggest thing about building this site, and, and now we're talking about WordPress, right? And now we're talking about building the actual thing that would become the product, or would be the product, just a minimal version thereof. So it had these courses, so it promised these courses, but I didn't have the content. Sorry about that. And technically I had this thing that I needed to dumb this down as much as I possibly can. I wanted to spend as little money, as little development time as possible building this thing. And to of building this thing, the whole thing consisted of that. We're talking about WordPress, Sensei to to run the to run the courses, do that easily, and a little bit of custom integration with the subscription payment service. That was mostly the only custom thing that we built, right? And we managed to do that within a couple of weeks on a very very small budget. The aim of that. MVP was literally just to get people to click to sign up and track those clicks. So, because I wanted to know what content people wanted. So go, again, going back to, I know I can produce the content at a cost and if I had time, one assumption. I know I can build the site, that's just a function of putting the time and the effort into actually building the, the site technically, it wasn't groundbreaking technically. But I wanted to know was, in terms of going, ahead what I needed to prioritize to make this real business. So getting people to click, tracking what they click on, and then actually getting them to pay me even though I didn't have something. 
And interestingly, this is what I did. So for anyone that signed up to Mailbox when the first came out and you were number 600,001 in the queue, that's what I did. I created a superficial queue. And you'd basically be able to sign up to PoeGreta and I would tell you, well, you were number 2,000 on in the line. So even the very first person that signed up with fair party tills, they essentially were like 2,303 in the line. Even though they were first, and the reason for that was and simply because those 2,000 email addresses I acquired, we had put them into the WordPress database. So they were the first X many users, right? But it created this kind of notion that, well, okay, I just signed up. I'm waiting. 80s pull that. Who will produce the goods? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously though, I, I, and this is a side note, I'm actually really, 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 really passionate about this whole thing. And if you want, I mean, this was, the, the, the talk isn't about the validation per se, but anyone that's read the whole case study on it, that wants to talk to me afterwards, even if you want to tell me I am the biggest douche on earth, like, do it. I, I love those conversations. So because we had, so after that, because we had actually captured those credit card details, I knew, like 100% sure, that people actually wanted to sign up. And they were willing to pay me. So at that stage, I knew that with very, very minimal work, powered by WordPress, I could build this thing, and I had people pay me. And the great thing about capturing those credit cards is, so again, disclaimer, and many, you know, loads of people misunderstand me in this regard. So yes, I didn't have a product. I pretended to sell you something. I never charged anyone that thing. It was merely a way to make sure that you were going to pay me. And the interesting thing is this, and it comes back to that FOMO. To actually make sure that someone is willing to pay you, there needs to be some exchange of money. Like someone, Someone can come here now and say, hey, like when I go home tonight, I'm going to sign up for your thing, or I'm going to buy your thing. And until they actually do that, it's mostly bullshit. That's what they call kind of conversion optimization. That's why so many people hit your site, and like, yeah, this looks cool. They ran, you know, I totally want this. And they never actually pay. Until they actually pay, you don't know that they're going to pay you. There's absolutely no guarantee. And the thing about just capturing the email address, just registering some kind of interest. There's, there's absolutely no cost to someone to say, listen, lady, here's my email address, because I am interested in this thing that, I'm going to, that you're going to build, but there's no expense in doing that. I, I'm just going to send them an email down the line and say, ah, you know, I don't like this, and they're going to answer. Try But by actually capturing credit card details, you already put people through that fun one. You know that whoever comes out on their side, they are a true reflection of where this thing has legs, whether you have actually validated the assumptions. And the tricky thing here was that after that, I actually had to figure out why people have paid us. And even then, if you speak about kind of assumptions and validating those assumptions, people actually didn't pay me for the video content. They paid me for other stuff and for other reasons. And two months down this line, I'm still finding out that people are you know, kind of paying us right now for reasons that I didn't think of. The great thing about that though was that customers, people that actually pay you money, they have an inherent like, interest in whatever you do with what they tell them, right? So it's not just someone saying some kind of... What am I doing wrong? So it's not just kind of those armchair critics saying, you know what, you should totally build this feature. It's actually people that would benefit or not benefit if you build that feature. So you're actually validating those assumptions from people, again, that really, really matter. You're not building this thing for those people that aren't paying you and that might never pay you. I mean, that's kind of, I don't even know what to call that, except really stupid. 
So through this feedback, what we eventually did was we learned that people, our customers, didn't actually want the, you know, the video content, the educational content, and they actually just wanted a community. So we literally, that is the first post in a new community, our new community. And again, so just one step back, WordPress initially did test ideas. Then I built a whole WordPress thing to validate ideas and take credit cards. And then the very first version of our product was WordPress again. And this is WordPress running P2 and a slightly modified version by the new, very, very cool Houston P2 theme by the by the guys. And that was it. And our customers loved it. And the greatest thing about this whole thing was that because I bootstrapped my startup, I had revenue on day one. I didn't have to kind of figure out where money was going to come from. There was revenue on day one. Not profitability, but revenue. Real revenue, actual money going into the bank. And in terms of kind of talking actual math, that is literally what happened. That's why, or what the kind of process produced. So after taking, capturing all those credit card details initially, I was able to make $4,000 within 47 minutes, and those 47 minutes was down to machine time because the machine could only build people so quickly, right? We launched with something, so once they're back, the B2 setup, modifying that took us four or five hours from beginning to end, so literally registering the domain, setting up the subdomains, pointing it to the server, setting up the server, installing WordPress, blah, 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 blah to bring a you know, couple of modifications to, to the actual theme. So in theory, again, talking about minimum viable product, what is the like, least amount of work that I can do to get from point A to point B? Right? And this is a lesson, by the way, in bootstrap. It's not about starting a, a new startup and saying, you know what, I want to be a billion dollar business. Right? For me, bootstrapping a business is all about saying, what can I do today? I'm at point A today. What can I do to move to point B? And when I get there, I'm going to figure out what, I do, you know, what I'm going to do to get to point C. And maybe somewhere down the line, I might start thinking about, like, let's put the, you know, points A, B, and C into actual numbers and how big this thing you know, can be. But again, in terms of figuring out those first steps, when you're walking into a dark room, you want to know where the light switch is or the shortest way to where the live switch probably is. And that's what WordPress does. And I'll end off so with this, right? Look at WordPress, and this is why WordPress works. And this is why WordPress works probably for any kind of site, any kind of startup that you want to build. Even if you just did the initial bit of the validation, so e or just the deep capturing bit, we are essentially building a landing page on WordPress, and you're just capturing details, right? I truly believe that so many startups would benefit from starting just there. You can do it minimal amount of time, zero to no budget. If you can have the kind of technical chops to put it together yourself, even better, then it's just a function of your time. The only thing that you can do is if that thing fails or blocks, is the time you invest that's actually getting there. And I think that's me. Cool. Gentlemen and ladies, uh, now's your chance to ask any, any questions you might have, uh, not only about this talk, but about public beta as well, maybe what you're up to. So uh, let, let's open the floor. Um, going back to the thing you said about product ship, um, you have a decent following, but for somebody who has an idea, but um, not, not a big following, if you set up a landing page like that, how would you get people to come to your landing page so that you can start collecting emails? Yeah, so um, I would take a leaf out of 37 Signals book, right? And the way they went about things prior to actually building Basecamp, so for those people that don't know, um, they were consulting at the time, Basecamp was an internal pro you know, project. 
But the way they got into doing working on products was to actually create educational products. So they literally, one of the very first things was uh, some kind of a, a white paper on design. And that's how I would do it. I would literally create something that is of value, of value to someone else, where I can actually teach someone something. Where, and, and teaching being a multiplier, so they might pay me 10 or 20 or 50 bucks for it, but if they apply it correctly, it would have a 10 or 20, 30 X impact on their business. And that's where I would start. Literally just teaching people, writing, even just starting on the blog. Eh? It's trickier these days to build an audience, um, but that's how I would do it. Just build an audience of like-minded people by teaching, by adding value, capturing those details. And when you get to the point where you have a landing page, you can push people there. Cool, we've got another question back there. Hi, Lee. Um, from, your, from day one till now, how long has it been? What day one? From, you, from the idea. So for Cloudy Beta? Yeah. Six months? So, so, but I mean, like from, from day one, how long it took to for your first income? So, well, month two. So what I did is I started the whole process. Whilst we were doing this, I also wrote a book on branding. And that became the first product that we released. So it was about a month. Uh, any other questions for Amy? Here in the front. Hi. I will bring the microphone to you. Don't worry, I'll get it. <laughs> Curious if you talk a little bit more about the validation. Um, you mentioned trying different things on how to get people to convert to actual buy, and you also talked about um, you know just simple math the 47 minutes. You know, to, to a simple math that looks like a success. So, at what point do you say there's some optimization that can happen here? What did you learn during those validation experiments? Yeah, so optimization is something interesting. I think optimization mostly only happens at scale. Um, so, at a point where you have a, you know, a big audience where you literally kind of have big data. So I've not tried to optimize our messaging at all. I'm literally trying to, I subscribe to kind of uh, the, the mantra of Simon Sinek in his book Start With Why says, uh, do business with, you know, with people that believe what you believe, right? So your early adopters are those people that kind of read through the inefficiencies on the site. They don't worry about the copywriting. They see something there that other people don't. Right, the laggards or the whatever, the whole curve in terms of adoption. And that's what you need to do. And, and I think only at the point where you really start to grow and you kind of want to go after that, accelerating that growth, that's where you, you kind of optimize, where you say, well, you know, I have this net already. All I need to do is I need to make a whole smaller so that people don't slip through. But it's very, very difficult to do this scenario. As I said, I, I've not spent, to this day, I've not spent any time trying to figure that out at all. Watch out for the holiday, by the way, just in case. I did fall through the stage earlier. That's the reason I'm watching you. Was it fun? It was fun. Um, it's not one of the top ten moments of my life, <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was it was pretty cool, I guess. It was pretty cool. I think people think I'm cool now. Any more questions for Eddie, by the way? Don't worry, I'm not going to list the top ten moments of my life in case that's what you're worrying. <laughs> but uh, any more questions? No. Great. Uh, put your hands together again for any people. Thank you. There's one question there. There's one question there. No question will go unanswered. I didn't miss, miss that out. Sorry. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, Co-founder of Woofie. Hi. Hi. Um, do you recommend people go home and validate their business in the same way you did with public beta, asking for credit card details? And what's your <laughs> learning on that? Uh, the short answer is yeah. I mean, I... So I think in terms of, I don't think I find here the thing. The only thing is I think most people that have done similar things don't speak about price. And I think that at least where I stand today, that there's loads of things that could be improved on in terms of the technique. And for me to kind of say, yes, definitely do it, would mean I'm basically saying that I believe in the ethos and the principles around it, but I don't think that it's a, a perfect process at all. But yeah, I mean, like, seriously, like, if you want to know if someone wants to buy something that you can produce, just ask them for their credit card details. If they don't want to give you credit card details, then you have their own answer. Don't pull that. Simple as that. 
All right, thanks very much. Thank you.